Modesto. This will be presented by writer Bill Ayers with Bernardine Dorn, former weather folk, now fierce social justice activists. Thursday, December 1st at St. John's Presbyterian Church, 2727 College Avenue in Berkeley. There's free parking and wheelchair access at this KPFA benefit. Advanced tickets at brownpapertickets.com and indie bookshops. For Bill and Bernardine, December 1st. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for your own health and fitness. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm health integrationist Lena Berman with Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett. We come to you weekly with a critical, independent voice on the politics and practice of health and the environment. A recent show we did on the dangers of statins and and the entire cholesterol-lowering strategy brings us to the question of which fats people should eat. There's still a lot of confusion left over from the many decades of low-fat fanaticism and the food industry's response. People still believe that eating mostly polyunsaturated vegetable fats and eschewing animal and saturated fats is best. And like everything, the truth is more complicated. For this reason, we thought it best to re-review the nature of the many different fats we can choose from and include guidelines for choosing them. It won't surprise you to discover that natural, minimally processed or unprocessed fats are the best and that a balance of fats is what we're designed for. Join us now for a discussion about dietary fat. It's always a good idea to start at the very beginning, which is to discuss uh, the makeup of fats. And I will tell you that if you want to read more on any of the stuff that we're talking about, there are three sources that are going to be very uh, important for you. The first is the book Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon, because this is the first book that Sally did, and she did it with Dr. Mary Ennig, a lipid researcher who is now deceased. She was uh, elderly, actually, when they wrote this. And the whole fat section is, is written by Mary Ennig. And indeed, if you want to go even deeper, Mary Ennig did write a book, Um, Her book isn't easy to read, but it is a very good reference book. It's called Know Your Fats, and it's probably only available in used copies. It may not be easily available, but again, Nourishing Traditions has much of the information you would need. And then if you want to read more, I mean, Nourishing Traditions also has all the research in it, you know, like going back to the Framingham studies and how how do we know these things that we're saying? Well, it's all in here, you know, in Nourishing Traditions, also in Know Your Fats. And indeed, The Cholesterol Myths, which is the book we referenced a bit uh, during the Staten Show, The Cholesterol Myths with an S at the end by Ufi, U-F-F-E, Ravenskov, R-A-V-N-S-K-O-V, M-D and Ph.D., who is a Danish researcher living in Sweden. His book, which was published by Sally Fallon's uh, New Trends Publishing, has all of the all of the research in it and it goes down the list of the myths that people have about cholesterol in particular and health and um also talks about other forms of fats and what the problems might be with them or the you know whatever but for the benefits nourishing traditions know your fats uh both book nourishing traditions and cholesterol myths has lots of research so uh, if you want to look up anything that i mention here or if you want to read the research read the the abstracts and discussion that's where you find it so all fats fall into several different categories and i will be brief here because it's this information may not help you but it's worth having having some familiarity with these terms You've all heard these terms, which is saturate, saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat. But what does that mean? Saturated fat is when all the available carbon bonds are occupied by a hydrogen atom. So they're very stable. This is why they uh, don't go rancid when you leave them on the kitchen table, if they're, if they're natural saturated fats. Um, and you can cook, you know, high heat with saturated fats. 
they um they they will be as i said uh, solid or semi solid at room temperature and your body makes saturated fatty acids from carbohydrates and they're found in animal fats and they're in tropical fats as you may know monounsaturated fats are the ones that have one double bond in the form of twin carbon atoms double bonded to each other and therefore they lack two hydrogen atoms so your body also makes monounsaturated fats from saturated fatty acids and uses them in all kinds of ways um they are relatively stable they don't go rancid easily and they can be used in cooking but uh, monounsaturated mono fatty acids are most common they're commonly in food in a form called oleic acid and that's olive oil but it's other oils too it's some of this the uh, nut oils almonds pecans cashews peanuts and avocados vegetable have monounsaturated and you would be surprised to know that pork fat is indeed very high in monounsaturated so this is the one everybody loves and thinks is wonderful um one of the problems is that uh monounsaturated fat in my experience of reading about these fats is more likely to cause weight gain than saturated fats and we can talk about why as we get further into the show so polyunsaturated fats these are the babies who so these are the ones that were promoted when this first uh, this first cholesterol fear mongering thing started many many years ago with the low fat diets and issuing fats but you could have polyunsaturated this is a real gangbuster thing for the food industry who started making very dangerous fake fats in the form of margarines trans fats which we've discovered cause cancer and all sorts of heart disease and all sorts of mischief incidentally Mary Ennig was one of the main people uh, whose research and her research and her activism is part of the reason trans fats finally uh, were taken down several pegs and, and now everyone knows they're dangerous Polyunsaturated fats have two or more pairs of double bonds and therefore they lack four or more hydrogen atoms. They are because they they're liquid even when they're refrigerated. The unpaired electrons at the double bond makes them highly reactive. So these these oils go rancid easily, very easily. Uh, and they have to be handled with care. They really should never be heated or used in cooking. Now, there are some exceptions that I'll talk about where you can maybe use them as a coat on something when you're baking slowly or something. But um, in general, they're very volatile. And because they're volatile and can be damaged easily, they're tricky and their use should be considered you should use them in a considerate way that doesn't mean you have to avoid them it just means but you know even a good olive oil if it's good quality virgin organic olive oil is going to have some susceptibility to being overheated and burned and damaged jeffrey you had something one of the things that fats as i'm sure you know is used for is to power the body it's an energy source and the reason why bodies make saturated fat rather than polyunsaturated fat, is that saturated fats have the highest energy potential. Yeah, they do. Polyunsaturated yes. fats have the least energy potential. So from your body's standpoint, from an energy consumption standpoint, saturated fats are a much better fuel. There's a section in Mary Ennick's book, Know Your Fats, where she discusses the fact that she's comparing the the amount of energy storage you get from fat versus carbohydrates mm. and points out the fact that you can see this with animals who are uh, like gorillas, mountain gorillas, who are reliant on lots of vegetable material and carbohydrates to keep going, and they're very large animals, but they're also very kind of they have a lot of fat on their body so one of the things that's confusing for people is they think if you eat fat you're going to have more fat on your body but in fact it's it's the opposite if you eat good quality saturated fats um as your primary fat you're more likely to to stay lean because they pack so much energy into a small you know they're not going to you're not going to be carrying around a lot of fat it's different the saturated fat is anyway so we'll we'll also get back to that too now indeed the other things that you can do with fats is break them into short chain fatty acids which have six carbon atoms you won't be tested 
these are saturated fats. They have antimicrobial properties. So, you know, some of these, including butter, it turns out, and coconut oil and some of these others uh, are, are antimicrobial and antifungal. They don't need to be acted on by the bile sal- salts, but they're generally absorbed for quick energy. For, so as Jeffrey was just saying, for this reason, they're less likely to cause weight gain than olive oil or commercial vegetable oils. Medium chain fatty acids have 8 to 12 carbons atoms and are found mostly in butter fat and tropical oils. So these are, again, antimicrobial. Um, they're absorbed directly for quick energy, as Jeffrey pointed out, and they contribute to the health of the immune system. Very important point about fats that are saturated. Long chain fatty acids um, have 14 to 18 carbon atoms for the geeky people in the audience and can be either saturated, monounsaturated, or polyunsaturated. And very long chain fatty acids have 20 to 24 atom uh, carbon atoms, and they tend to be highly, highly unsaturated with four or five, you know, this just it gets very complicated. But now some people can make these fatty acids into essential fatty acids in your body, but there are others who can't. Uh, for instance, diabetics or people with blood sugar abnormalities cannot turn oleic acid into essential fatty acids. They have to come directly from fish um, and things like that to get the EFAs. So so the animal foods are organ meats, egg yolks, butter, and fish oils. So you, you know about that. So uh, the important thing here is that the essential fatty acids have to be consumed in your food. Uh, they don't, it's rare for people to be able to make them in their bodies automatically. And um, they're responsible for a whole bunch of really good actions in the body. So... That's kind of the very shorthand version of what fats are about and how they're broken up. So you understand that there's mostly saturated, polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated. So one of the reasons for using saturated fats primarily, aside from the energy use that we just talked about, and aside from the fact that they're stable, which is very important because... If if you if you are using oils that are easily damaged by heating or rancidity, which saturated fat is not, then you run into inflammatory problems from the fats you're eating. So fats can be easily damaged when they're polyunsaturated. So saturated fats have a number of reasons uh, why they should be preferred. One reason is that they don't skew a very delicate balance in our bodies between the omega-6 fats, which are the polyunsaturated vegetable oils, and the omega-3s, which are these very delicate polyunsaturated oils that we find in fish and in some cases in, you know, in other vegetable sources like flax. Again, remember that flax or hemp seed or those sorts of things work but don't work for people with blood sugar abnormalities and don't work for cats. I don't know about dogs. So fish oils are the most direct thing. When you get an imbalance between the omega-6 polyunsaturates and the omega-3s, there starts to be some substantial health problems, including um, issues with heart and mental mental capacity and mental illness. Uh, there's a number of reasons for using polyunsaturated fats. They're mildly, the, the polyunsaturated fish oils, for instance, the omega-3s, they are... Um, protective in a number of ways. They work very well in cases of uh, psychiatric symptoms. They are mildly immunosuppressant, um, but if you have somebody with an autoimmune disease or some kind of runaway infection, sometimes that can be, especially in autoimmune, it can be very important to use fish oils in higher doses. So it's very dose dependent, but a modest dose of omega-3 fatty acids with with you know, the usual complement of antioxidant vitamins in your diet, including vitamin E, doesn't have to be taken at the same time, to protect those oils which are so easily rancid, they, come, they go south so easily, just the heat of your body will put them at risk. So, so having the antioxidants in the diet and having not an imbalance between those and the omega-6s, which can also cause problems in the body from them going rancid or becoming damaged so again not saying 
Polyunsaturated fats are bad. They, they're part of our diet. They're in our foods, and they're important, and certainly the omega-3s. But if there's an imbalance, you see a whole, you see study after study after study showing how people get into trouble when the omega-3 to 6 balance is skewed toward omega-6. Do you have anything that you want to add to this so well, far? <clears throat> I was just going to say that there is uh, a, a recent review in the journal Lipids, which was devoted to new research on diet, uh, dietary fats. And um, what one of the things they note in the commentary on it is that there's been considerable research about an imbalance in omega-6s because of the uh, this this push to substitute uh, polyunsaturated fats for saturated fats, finding an association between an uh, imbalance of sixes with allergies, asthma, immunosuppression, decreased fertility, preeclampsia, encep- uh, encephalitis, and oh. cancer. Yeah, well, it's it's well known that the um Omega sixes, the vegetable oils, the highly polyunsaturated oils, as I said, are easily damaged, and um, they can cause mischief. So that's good that you found that study that that helps to explain that. So you know, one of the things that happens with this cholesterol busting stuff, where everybody's trying to get cholesterol to go away. Oh, I should just mention you're listening to your own health and fitness. Lena Berman and Jeff Fawcett were discussing dietary fat. And and I should explain that this, this was started by, it was actually... Um, well, are you talking about the dietary guidelines yeah, or, the, the, or the cholesterol, the, the, the Ansel the, Keys the, stuff? No, I'm talking about when, oh, when there was oh, this... Oh, it was, it was under, the, under when George McGovern was McGovern, a senator. McGovern, thank you. And they McGovern. put together the dietary right. thing. And right. the guys who are now at... Um, Science and the public interest were on his staff, and they were avid vegetarians. Yes, and they really pushed this this uh, forward. So they did an experiment, basically, on the public for the last, now it's almost 30 years. 40. 40 years. How soon we forget. And actually what we've seen is this just... The, the, that heart disease has exploded it's become worse and obesity rates are up and anyway it seems not to be working so there's plenty of research as I said in the cholesterol myths and also in uh, Marianne and very Sally Fallon's book Nourishing Traditions but let's talk about the benefits of cholesterol uh, to begin with here for a minute blood uh, it's, it, it, it controls your it helps to control your blood sugar it gives you terrific satiety um, it, it, it increases and protects your brain. Um, I'm trying to read two things simultaneously. Your hormones are made out of cholesterol. Your lung surfactant is made out of cholesterol. Immune function is dependent on cholesterol. And as we mentioned in the last show, when cholesterol is driven down, immune function plummets. Uh, and indeed, um, mental disorders and psychiatric stuff it gets worse when people's cholesterol is low. Um, so the reasons that blood lipids go up and down, uh, it might be worth reminding people that uh, under stress, your cholesterol level will go up, partially because you have to make adrenal hormones during stress, and you can't make them without cholesterol. Cholesterol goes to places where repair is needed, where things need to be repaired. It carries antioxidants. If you are eating a high sugar and high starch diet, your cholesterol will go up. And if you avoid fat in your diet, your body will kick up the cholesterol and triglycerides because they're so essential. Um, and I've gotten, I need to go to Mary Ennig. Um, here to continue, Jeffrey, if you have. Oh, sure. Um, one of the things that uh, is essential is to understand that there is a um, argument that there is a step between saturated fat, high cholesterol, and heart disease. That's that's the driving force 
behind the theory. And it's now been pretty much demonstrated that in both steps, the science, the, the accept, generally accepted science is wrong. So that the association between saturated fat and cholesterol is that LDL, low density lipoprotein, which is a fat, um, carries things around in, in your blood. One of the things it carries is cholesterol. And when it does, that particle is nice and fluffy. And that nice fluffy uh, particle is associated with good cardiovascular outcomes. There's another particle, uh, high, high density LDL, which is associated with high carbohydrate diet that is associated with higher risk of cardiovascular disease and events. So, uh, and, and following on that, that chain between, and in addition, the, the causative, there's never been, uh, a consistent demonstration that there's a relationship between cholesterol and serum cholesterol in your blood and mm-hmm. risk of heart disease. So and that's, fact, that's the work of Ufi, Ufi. Ravenskopf has, has picked that, that one apart. Well, and that's why it's called cholesterol myths, as you go yes. down the list of myths. So, so some other uh, quick things is that there's never, and this is both Ufi, Ufi and Mary Ennig and various other researchers and skeptics too, uh, cholesterol's never been in any study shown to increase heart risk for women. It's th- much more complicated why women get heart disease. It's much more about hormone imbalances and stress and, uh, in fact, dietary mistakes like damaged fats and things like that. But women are very susceptible to heart disease from stress. Um, Older individuals, in fact, the women with highest cholesterol, older adults in general, are, are, have on all research shown to live longer unless their blood sugars are high. And that's because of what Jeffrey just said about lipoprotein A. Um, o- older people need more cholesterol because of the phospholipids in our brain. They need it for brain function. They play a vital role in the health of our bones. Would you think of that? Isn't that interesting? For calcium to be effectively incorporated into the skeletal structure, at least 50% of dietary fats should be saturated. That's modest. Uh, They protect the liver from toxins and alcohol and drugs, even prescription drugs. And um, they enhance the immune system, as I said. They are needed for proper utilization of essential fatty acids. I mentioned that as well. now, one of the things that, that get, gets cholesterol a bad name, one of the myths about cholesterol is that there's this thing called oxidized cholesterol. say, so, oh, well, see, it's not just cholesterol, it's this oxidized cholesterol, and one wonders what that's about. What Ufi says about oxidized cholesterol is not surprising. He says it's, a mis- it's mistaken. It's a mistake that people are connecting this to cholesterol. It's actually back to the polyunsaturated fatty acids promoting oxidation of cholesterol and other atherosclerosis. So if you eat too many polyunsaturated fats, they can uh, be damaged in the body, and and when they're damaged, they create a lot of oxidative uh, stress and problems. What uh, Mary Ennig says is that the primary reason for oxidation of cholesterol is from f- food processing because they process foods to make them into powders and uh, like milk powders and egg powders all these foods that are so highly processed uh, the cholesterol is damaged from the processing and the heating and the spraying and the powdering and all this stuff so, and then the other thing of course is the fake fats the trans fats which are not even real fats you know in margarines and things like that. Um, Now we're moving away from that because we know that that's dangerous. But, you know, in small ways, even when you... So so we are saying that using powdered protein things that are high in... that have fat, like eggs and things like that, that indeed you you are increasing the amount of oxidized cholesterol in those products because of the damage of the cholesterol. Now, in a small way, there's a question about when you're eating eggs, which are a fantastic uh, food because... 
eggs have all this nutrients in the yolks and the cholesterol that's there has never been shown to raise cholesterol levels in people it's very protective now part of the reason for that is because eggs have egg whites and egg whites have albumin and albumin blocks the absorption of things like iron and it also balances out some of the uh, anyway it's it's a very healthy food but you don't want to throw them in a blender <laughs> no i mean I, no you're laughing but people do that they make you know whatever so if you want to whip your eggs you know the best way to cook your eggs is, is soft boiled but some of us don't like runny whites so you can do just a, a softer yolk if you fry them but if you want to scramble them do it gently just take a whisk and do just enough to get them to mix together don't whip them and um so it's the the oxidized cholesterol is is mostly from these uh food processing mistakes and also from imbalances with these these oxidized fats damaged fats so uh, to go a little further damaged fats also are a primary cause of cancer and immune dysfunction polyunsaturates fake trans fats they are extremely dangerous um so I've already mentioned the low cholesterol and mental dysfunctions and, and low omega-3 is also. So the brain on cholesterol. Here's something, that, Jeffrey, you might want to discuss. We have enough time for you to start doing that. You can avoid dementia and Alzheimer's by keeping your blood sugars down. So why don't you talk about this paper about how high insulin blocks a certain enzyme? Well, actually, it's. Um, I think the, the discussion is in... Uh Bruce Fife's book. No, actually, the paper is not in the book. He doesn't. He talks. Oh, he just he talks about, about the concepts, but he doesn't. Do, you don't. Do, well, yeah. it, um, insulin is is the uh, hormone that um, opens up cells so that glucose, blood sugar, can be absorbed and then used as energy or stored as as energy. And to do that, uh, among other things, there is a key enzyme that's used. It's called GLUT4. When blood sugars are high, insulin levels go up in order to respond. And if you have uh, metabolic syndrome or prediabetes or diabetes or any of those those categories that that uh, they've invented to do things to you that um, your insulin levels uh, your insulin levels respond and if you have high glucose in your brain um, insulin levels will be high and GLUT4 levels will decline which means that your brain will starve your brain lives on sugar and in fact if you are a type 1 diabetic, one of the things that you are in danger of is your body producing um, ketones. If you, can't, if you have a, a blood sugar crash, uh, uh, producing ketones, and that exists in your body to keep your brain going. Uh, in, in the event of... So, so your body has mechanisms to make sure that your, your brain gets the nu- nutrients, the nutrition that it needs, the calories that it needs to, to run itself. Um, so it already has a mechanism for low blood sugars, but when blood sugars are high and run high, what happens is the brain gets starved because the... And what hypoglycemic it becomes hypoglycemic because it's blunted it isn't getting into the brain yes um, because that enzyme uh, is underproduced because insulin levels are high there's this hydraulic thing that, that's going on so high blood sugars consistently high blood sugars not transient high blood sugars that go up and down but consistently high blood sugars uh, causes consistently high insulin levels, cause consistently low enzyme levels, which start, which makes it um, difficult for the brain, brain cells, to feed themselves, and so this whole cascade of events happens that affects the the neurology of the brain, 
and leads to dementias, dementias and other neuro or the other neurological uh, problems, including Alzheimer's disease. In fact, I remember from reading this paper that the Alzheimer pl- the plaques are come into the come show up because they're actually trying to to do something protective. <laughs> but they, you know, it's an imbalance. It's another imbalance. So well, the beta amyloid that yeah. forms the plaques is a is something that ordinarily occurs, but it like that hydraulic thing with insulin and blood sugars and uh, enzymes. It goes up and down in response to things normally, but when blood sugars build up and the cells can't do anything with it, the beta amyloid starts to accumulate and then it forms into plaques yeah the body does things for a reason uh we need to stop for a very brief musical break i'm lena berman this is your own health and fitness i'm with jeff fawcett dr fawcett and i are talking about dietary fats we're trying to it's a very complicated topic so i'm sorry that it seems complicated it is complicated so we're going to take a brief musical break and when we come back we'll continue this discussion about dietary fats so stay with us please our website your own health and fitness for easy or extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature find information about our book too much medicine not enough health and get a free uh, as i said a free stream there's lots more at your own health and fitness.org all spelled out if you want to reach us reach us by email at admin admin at your own health and fitness Org. So we'll continue now our discussion, uh, Lena Berman, Jeff Fawcett, on dietary fats. So to continue on in that, in that, w- what you're talking about is the the danger, and this is an important point to make. There is a danger in having high insulin levels. Insulin is a hormone, and it's there to rebalance and to help with the utilization of sugar. But it's like the kid who cried wolf. If you have too much sugar all the time and the insulin's high all the time, insulin is, is toxic to the heart and to various other tissues. It also skews your sex hormones. And if it does that, then, um, well, see, now I've lost my <laughs> it, it, it What happens is that it, it's going, it, it, is you don't want insulin to stay up that high because then your tissues become blunted it becomes you your body won't respond to the insulin signal your body will just continue to uh the insulin will continue to come up and you will eventually develop a a very serious metabolic disruption your blood sugars will stay high your sex hormones will get skewed so the one of the reasons for eating good quality undamaged and as and and favoring saturated fats but including others is so that you have satiety and your blood sugars stay down because you're not tempted to eat things that are sweet and starchy what i was going to say is that insulin uh, is not just a regulator of glucose it does a number of other things because it's part of the nutrition cycle it stimulates for instance um uh use of protein to conversion of protein, breakdown of protein, and, and its building of muscle. Um, so there are a wide variety of things that that insulin does, which um, we're just starting to explore what it 
uh, what it does. So high insulin levels can be toxic. And as Lena mentioned, it has been known for some time that insulin can be cardiotoxic, that it is in particular uh, hard on the heart. So, you know, it, it, one of the things that, that should follow here, Jeffrey, is, is a discussion about how we make energy in the body in a healthy way, because the body prefers to use fat as a fuel, even though in the early stages of any effort, like studying hard all night, using your brain, using a lot of sugar, or a burst of energy, you're moving, you're carrying boxes, um, even having sexual relationships, you know, having good stress even, exercise, you mobilize in the early stage of an adaptative adaptive stress response, you're going to have a mobilization of sugar used as a kind of kindling to get your energy production going. But for it to be sustained, have your energy sustained, it likes, your body prefers to use fat. That's why when you take a run or you do something where you can still breathe, aerobic exercise, you're burning fat as a fuel. But the more fat is available and the more fit you are and the more bo- your body's kind of trained to use fat as a fuel, the more it will use fat as a fuel instead of sugar. It's not that you don't eat any carbohydrates. Vegetables and fruits uh, have carbohydrates in them. And the amount that you consume is going to be dependent on what your blood sugars are like. People vary a lot. If your blood sugars are over 100, you probably have to really be careful with fruit and certainly not eat starches like grains and potatoes and noodles and all those things. So you're going to have to depend on good quality proteins and good fats that give you good satiety in vegetables, you know, for carbohydrates. If you're really healthy, you can tolerate a little more. But having an imbalance in your energy production is part of what causes a whole cascade of other problems like Jeffrey is alluding to, even having heart disease connected to insulin levels being too high and having very, very um, messed up hormone levels because your hormones, your sex hormones are contested uh, by cortisol, which goes up in the presence of too much insulin. So if you could talk a little bit about energy production and healthy energy production, that would be helpful for people, I think. Well, I think the clue for me was when I first started studying this that what does your body actually turn most of the carbohydrate, the sugar that you consume? What does it, what does it do with it? Does it burn it all at once? No. What it does is it turns it into fat. Um, it turns it into fat and it stores it. Now it can turn some of it, but a, a, a small amount of it proportionately um, into glycogen, which gets stored in your liver, and some of it gets stored in uh, muscle, skeletal muscle, so that it can be converted quickly into sugar in the event of an emergency. But most of what carbohydrates get turned into is body fat. And the cells and the mitochondrion cells have processes for uh, turning all of that, uh, either glucose or fatty acids, into ATP, which is little power packs that actually fuel the cells and and give you energy. The uh, thing, that, one of the things to notice about, for instance, uh, um, burn, burning energy. When you're burning energy, if you're doing aerobic exercise. Depending on your level of fitness, you will start breathing deeply, not gasping for breath. You will start breathing deeply sooner or later in your exercise. The sooner you start breathing deeply, that means you're getting, your body's asking for a lot of oxygen. And it's using that oxygen to burn fat. So um, the people who are in in good cardiovascular shape um, burn fat pretty easily and and pretty readily. So now we have we have an idea of how the energy metabolism of the body works, how the brain requires sugar. Uh, one thing also to mention about ketones is that. Uh, there is a condition in diabetics called ketone acidosis, which is not the same as producing ketones from eating a lower 
Carbo- eating a very low carbohydrate diet. I mean, a, a ketogenic diet is not going to produce the same kind of condition in diabetics as acid keto 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 acidosis. Keto acidosis. It sounds like a song. Um, so, so the ketone business is the, how the brain is protected uh, by the conversion. Uh, in the in the liver um, to making these ketones so that the brain can survive without sugar and can also sort of you're sort of creating sugar out of foods that aren't usually sources and those are made from fats yeah fats and stuff so so you have a sense now of how that works and we made reference to the Bruce Fife's book about uh, protecting your brain from Alzheimer's and, and other neurological diseases by eating a ketogenic diet and this issue of a blood sugar, you know, knowing you knowing how much carbohydrate you can eat based on uh, what your blood sugars are. It's pretty simple. So his book is worth looking at. He is, he is stressing coconut oil, and my experience is that coconut oil is good and it's good for a variety of reasons but not everybody does well on coconut oil everybody's different so one other oil to consider is butter and um butter is quite remarkable so i'd like to to read a little i'd like to go over a little bit what's actually in butter and people feel guilty if they eat butter the important thing to remember about butter is it really should be from it's best if it's from grass-fed cows and also if it's uh, unpasteurized and organic and all of that but there's or just organic butter is still going to be better than a lot of other things out there to eat just a reminder this is your own health and fitness i'm lena berman jeff fawcett and i are talking about um dietary fats and um butter so what um it's it is a remarkable source of it helps it's, it helps you absorb fat-soluble vitamins. All fats do that. But there are some other things about butter that are particularly amazing. There's something called the Walson factor, which is the anti-stiffness factor. And this has to do with um, per, you know, protecting humans and animals from calcification of the joints. So degenerative arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. It also protects against harder, hardening of the arteries, cataracts, and calcification of the pineal gland. Um, so it's quite remarkable, even, you know, as a treatment protocol. <laughs> and it's only in present, it's only, as I said, in raw butter, cream, and whole milk. So it's, it, 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 again, you don't want to drink skim milk or 2% or 1%. You want whole fat milk because the butter fat is remarkable for protecting the body in so many situations. There's another... Uh, thing about f- butter fat is um, it has both short chain and medium chain fatty acids and as we said before these fatty acids have antimicrobial anti-tumor and immune system supporting properties um, and four carbon but- butyric acid and it's unique to butter. It's something that has antifungal properties as well as anti-tumor properties. Believe it or not, there's omega-6 and three essential fatty acids. So your EFAs are also in butter, but small amounts. Um, so it wouldn't be your main supply of that. And it has a substance called conjugated linoleic acid. And this, again, is from pasture-fed cows that are eating grass. And it's an extremely strong anti-cancer uh, material. It's, it, it also encourages the buildup of muscle and prevents weight gain. And it doesn't get produced. It isn't in butter when cows are fed hay or processed feed. There are vitamin companies selling conjugated leonic acid in capsules, but if you indulge in some butter from grass-fed cows, you'll have it. Lecithin, there's lecithin in butter. And as you know, that's is it's in the proper assimilation and metabolization of cholesterol and other fat constituents. And um, it also has glyco, oh boy, a type of lipid, glycophenyngeal lipids. I think I did that right. This type of fat protects against gastrointestinal infections. Would you believe this? 
especially in the very young and the elderly. And this is the reason why children who drink skim milk have diarrhea at rates of three to five times uh, from children who drink whole milk. So to think that milk could be protective. Now, not everybody tolerates milk. Some people can't do it. Uh, You can buy ghee which is which is butter oil which is the fat without the milk protein the milk fat the butter fat in it which is going to decrease you're not going to get all the same benefits from it as you would from real butter so it's going to vary um some people feel that if you eat only raw versions of butter fat and and dairy products that you're protected somewhat from the allergic conditions but some people are really viciously allergic to to dairy of any sort so you have to choose your own your own way of going so there's some surprising other sources of fat that people tend not to think about anymore because of of what's happened with this uh push for low fat diets and saturated polyunsaturated rather fats and that is Lard, for instance, pork lard, which is <laughs> has a con- has a constituent that is somewhat similar to olive oil, not entirely. It's forty percent saturated, forty eight percent monounsaturated. So that's that's going to have small amounts of antimicrobial palm palmolaic acid. So it's very very slightly polyunsaturated. So you can't get away from polyunsaturated fats. They're in everything. Um, it's Remarkable it used to always be used for cooking with, uh, you know, baking and things like that. And it, it, it may also have lauric acid in it if the pigs have eaten uh, coconuts. <laughs> That's not likely around here. It's very stable. Uh, it's very good for cooking. Probably offends a lot of, of vegetarians, but it, there you go. And then duck and goose fat are very good. Uh, chicken fat is okay but duck and goose fat is even better and you can get beef and and mutton tallows those things it's it's, you have to sometimes make these yourself you can sometimes find a source for the fat and then you can render it and and after you're done rendering it you end up with these crunchy little wonderful what would you describe them as pork rinds well it's like it isn't though it isn't it isn't pork pork rinds it's just it's crispy. It's like, the fat's yeah. been pr- sort of cooked out of it, and you have these crispy, wonderful things that are kind of freebies since they don't do anything to your blood sugar or your other fat ratio balance. Obviously, good quality olive oil. As I said, you still want to be careful about um, how you treat it because it's still it still can go rancid over time. It's much more stable than other things. There's now you can find macadamia nut oil. In general, I tell people to try to get. Uh, organic oils. Uh, part of the reason for this is because some of the seed oils and nut oils, it depends on where these these are coming from. Some places, some companies are testing for impurities, including pesticides and stuff. The question is where these nuts and seeds are coming from. And if they're from the U.S., likely they won't have this happen. But nuts and seeds that come from other countries are often gassed for insecticides and you know insects and stuff. Uh, peanut oil, sesame oil can be used. They're slightly more stable than regular polyunsaturated fats. You just want to be considerate because these are very high in omega-6 fats. Sesame oil, interestingly, is used a lot in like Ayurveda and other healing traditions. So for some people, it's a really good fat, and it contains a kind of unique group of antioxidants that are not destroyed by heat but is high in omega-6 so you want to you know maybe your salad you know um there's concerns about canola oil it's complicated i don't have a dog in this fight um it was created from rapeseed which which isn't very good for human consumption but i don't you know i'm not uh, i don't produce oils i don't have any associations with any of these companies and i don't i haven't looked at all the research but there has been concern with rapeseed uh because it contains very 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 long chain fatty acids something called uretic acid which under some circumstances is associated with fibro fibrotic heart lesions. That sounds like a reach, but it it apparently has shown up. Canola oil was bred not to contain this or very little of it, but the problem with canola oil is that 
it's very, very, it gets rancid really easily, and it also can get moldy really quickly. Um, and um, although it's supposed to have omega-3 fats in it during the deodorizing process, why they would do that, I don't know. It can, uh, it can ruin that, get rid of it. Um, flaxseed oil, hemp seed oil, they do have, they do have a type of, of omega-3. The, they have, you know, this, this oleic acid, and, but they're also high in omega-6s. They're very, very fragile. Again, you never want to put flaxseed oil or flax seeds or hemp seeds in anything hot. You know, we should stay cold. You should keep them in the freezer, maybe, or refrigerator when you're not using them. Flaxseed is a good, uh, it's a good fiber supplement if you grind it up and put it in something, you know, like a drink or something. But if you have any blood sugar abnormalities at all, uh, if there's anything in your history, if your family history or something where there's a problem, or if you're a cat, you, you're not going to be able to convert these into the long chain omega, omega-3 acids. Not the very, very long chain dangerous, but the, the long chain omega-3s, which are in fish. So fish is always a more direct. For people who are vegetarians, there is a product made from kelp, although we have to wonder how much radiation is in the ocean these days. Uh, that's a good source. So again, the tropical oils are the ones that tend to be um, really helpful and uh, stable. There's the most. There's the coconut oil, which everybody's jumping on the truck of the, for coconut oil. As I said, some people do well with coconut oil. Some people do not. Oddly enough, uh, too bad because it does have the lauric acid. Does have these nice things in it. But other other tropical fats that you probably know about is that now palm oil is available all over the place, and you've got two forms of it. One form is processed, so it's white, and it's refined. And in general, you don't want to eat any oil that's refined. You want everything to be unrefined and cold-pressed and all that. But with palm oil, when you refine it, what you're doing is basically getting rid of the red part of the of the uh, of the coconut, and that's where the, the sort of vitamin E like substances are. But when you remove them, the oil is much more stable for cooking. So you can even deep fat fry in in palm oil if you want. The red palm oil, not to be confused with palm kernel oil, which is also high in lauric acid, but very hard to find, and I don't even have a source for it organically. It's usually used in African cooking. But the red palm is available, and it's a little less stable in high heat cooking, but it has a sweet and uh, unique, almost carrot-like flavor. It it does stain your clothes if you're <laughs> slopping it around too much. Probably not good as a lubricant. Uh, excuse me for saying that. So, um, but it's... Um, <laughs> But it has a lot of vitamin E in it, and it can be used with a less less hot cooking temperature. If anyone does find out about a source of organic red uh, palm kernel, not red palm, but palm kernel oil in an organic form, I'd love to hear about it. You know, you can always email us at admin at your own health and fitness dot org. So what does that mean? You know, you get really. You know, we talked about broths and we've talked about cholesterol and we've done all this. So, so what do you do? Well, one of the problems is that because people's bodies are so unique and different, it's going to really depend on who you are and what you need to feel good, and that takes some experimentation. What you know now is that um, it's worthwhile knowing your your blood sugar reading, fasting. Because then you can make some intelligent decisions about how much carbohydrate to eat. Um, and you can also, t- you know, to be honest, you can take your clothes off and stand in front of a mirror and get a sense of how many carbohydrates you can eat. But, but it is the case that if you eat closer to a high-fat diet, you're less likely to put on weight. And obviously it helps if you exercise as well because then you're mobilizing that good energy cycle too. Um, and then, you know, how do you introduce the carbohydrates? Some people do really well with uh, uh, very small amounts of extremely unrefined grains of various sorts. Some people can't go near them for anything. So you have to decide who you are and experiment. My own preference has always been for the, the sort of paleo style diet. And that may not work for some people who maybe do better with some carbohydrates and can follow a modified vegetarian diet where they have high fat, you know, good quality uh, dairy products and and ethically raised eggs, eggs being a wonderful food. So in these last few moments, if you have more to add, what are your favorite ways to use fat and cook? 
You've got your own. You're a great butter fan. Oh, I love butter. Yeah. Um, for a while, I should go back and start doing this again. I was rendering um, what's called fatback, which is uh, pork. Which is pork. Uh, not as uh, not as hard as you would think. Rendering is just putting uh, cu- cubing up fatback and and um, heating it over a low heat and uh, letting it cook down over uh, ten, uh, 20, uh, not 20 minutes, to a couple hours. Several hours. A couple hours. Um, and it makes this really nice stuff. And the, 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 the trick is that it, commercially it is impossible to find organic lard. Or lard that is, that, that, I, I, I tell a lie. There are some very small uh, pork um, husbanders who um, who sell sell lard that's um, that's from their pig, their hogs. That, that are you know, yeah. yeah that are um, and the hogs are raised in environmentally friendly places so that they can be happy pigs. Um, but you can do it yourself if you can find some place that sells organic fat back. Or even in some cases natural. What we've discovered is that some places, it depends on the size of the operation. Uh, you can interview the supplier that's selling the pork and find out about how they treat the animals and whether or not they're GMO feed. Um, so that's very important. But one of the ways you can tell is that when animals are fed GMO foods, they're very unhealthy and the meat tastes terrible. So part of the way you can tell is by the quality of the meat. But it would be a small grower instead of a large one, and then you get you get some of the fat. They they sell it pretty inexpensively. That's a good fat. I like ghee. I like uh, palm. So find out what you prefer. Just understand the basic concept of... You don't, there's no bad fat. There are fats that are easily damaged and can cause mischief in your body. They're not bad. They, if you have small amounts of them and you treat them properly, they're okay to have. But you want to have, uh, make sure you have a source of omega-3s, like fish, if you can, fish oils. And you want to uh, eat a fair amount of the saturated fats, um, not a terrible terrible life you probably want the the polys for your salad or something so that takes us just about to the oh yeah go ahead well one last thing to promote saturated fats again is that one of the characteristics of saturated fat based diet versus diets where it has been eliminated is satiety yep. you're just going to feel better and another is taste one yeah. of the things that's happened with food is sugar has been replaced replaced with has or re- has replaced has, fat <laughs> has replaced fat in food because foods without fat are not palatable. Yeah, and they're putting fake fat in to give you the mouth feel of fat. Very dangerous stuff. Fake food, fake fat, damaged fats. Okay. I want to thank you all for listening. I'm Lena Berman. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card. Find out about our book, Too Much Medicine, Not Enough Health, a free stream of this week's show, and lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. And you can reach us at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at yourownhealthandfitness.org. Your Own Health and Fitness is produced by Lena Berman and Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett. Remember, being informed not only protects your health, protects your freedom. Tikkun Magazine is celebrating our 30th anniversary with a conference the weekend after the election, Saturday and Sunday, November 12th and 13th. This is to honor all of you social change activists and to bring the Bernie people and the Hillary people together to strategize so that we can be prepared for the challenges that will arise in the Hillary Clinton presidency. Also, we'll be giving the Tikkun Award to filmmaker Oliver Stone in person, Holly Near, Claiborne Carson, anti-racist activist Fania Davis, and others. 
Pre-registration is requested. For details, call 510-644-1200 or visit tikkun.org slash 30th celebration. That's T-I-K-K-U-N dot org slash 30th celebration. This is a benefit for Tikkun. I hope I'll see you there. Bam. Because of you, KPFA will be able to continue our wide-ranging, unfiltered coverage of this grave election season. Beginning Wednesday, November 2nd, through the day after Election Day, Wednesday,